There were two sides. One was all black and one was all white. They were looking at each other, cursing, screaming, fist clenched, knives. And we're off some distance, my friend and I. She turns to me and says, I don't know about you, but I'm going to pray. She drops to her knees and prays. Here I am. I have a dilemma. You know, at that point, I still don't believe in God. But if there's any chance, I knelt beside her and, and I said, you know, God, if there is a God, it still chucks me up. If there is a God, this can't possibly be your will. Do something. Just do something. I felt like I had to humble myself and, and do something. Just beyond your own personal experience, how do we know that demons are real? I saw Satan in his face, and I thought, oh my God, it felt like a palpable darkness that came onto my head. It felt like it was coming into me, that the demon tries to throw him in the water or into the fire. It's a way to kill him. This is really weird. What if that stuff is true? Once an atheist, now a retired theology professor and the author of 60 books, including the Manual for Spiritual Warfare, Dr. Thigpen's career actually started with a musical bent as the frontman of a Christian rock band that lit up Europe in the early 70s, which he followed up somewhat surprisingly as first tenor soloist with the Yale Glee Club. Join us as we discuss his extraordinary encounter with the diabolical that shattered his atheism and led him to explore the reality of the spiritual war that was at the core of his newfound faith. So, Paul, you claim that you had an experience with the diabolical that led you to reject atheistic materialism and then embrace Christianity. Can you explain for us exactly what happened? Well, a little, little background. I was uh, 12 years old in the seventh grade when uh, I think it was a history teacher. Uh, his extra reading gave me, gave me the, some of the writings of Voltaire, the, the French skeptical philosopher, and 18th century. And, um, and I read it and it just began to convince me that all the Christian stuff that I had was was probably just like another mythology. And um, I think part of it, I look at it back now, it was during this, from the age of 12 to the age of 18, may have been part of my, my version of uh, adolescent rebellion. But even though it was of the, the rollicking 60s back then, um, when most people were choosing either alcohol or drugs or you know, other stuff to rebel, I wasn't going to give my mind over to anything like that. So without realizing, I think probably that was part of what was pushing me toward accepting Voltaire and then other things I began to read. So I, um, for, for six years, then became convinced that there was no God, there was no a spiritual realm, no angels, no demons, no life after death, no survival of the consciousness after death, um, and began trying to kind of, in my own life, in small ways that I could live out the implications of that. And, um, but, you know, I still had this, this great hunger inside, as we all do. And uh, looking back now, I, I, mean, I guess a general way to put it would be a hunger for, for the transcendent, that uh, uh, my philosophy had reduced me to kind of matter and energy and whatever's around me motion. Um, and that hunger then pressed me to start looking in directions of things that I could still justify in my own mind as being scientific or part of, you know, in sitting with a materialist philosophy, but that still were beyond the normal. So we would now call them, for that reason, paranormal. Um, I began to look, uh, I did my seventh grade science project on um, parapsychology, on um, basically Psychokinesis, mind over matter, and um, other forms of, of paranormal phenomena. Wrote off to Duke University. They had a, an institute at that time for parapsychological studies. Got test materials, tested my classmates, had tests myself, got a blue ribbon on the project. And uh, that was the beginning for me of getting into a whole realm of looking at um, anomalies, anomalous things. And uh, it's kind of a short step from that to to looking at things like Ouija boards and seances, all the while thinking, okay, there's there's nothing out there on the outside that is moving this planchette on the the Ouija board or you know speaking through the medium in a seance. But I think there's probably some undiscovered power of the human mind uh, that we just haven't explained yet, and that yeah. would bear scientific study. So. I did that kind of thing, not realizing what I was getting into. And uh, so all that's important to say that then by my senior year of high school, um, one particular incident uh, just really shocked me. 
I uh, can't go out to too many details. I was with a couple of friends. Uh, we were walking at the beach. Uh, uh, I lived to grow up in Savannah, Georgia, and lived on one of the islands, so we went to the island of the beach nearby. And uh, while we were walking, one of those, I say, say one was a friend. He was uh, the friend of a friend who was visiting from another city. Didn't really know me well. And as we're walking out of the beach, all of a sudden he stops, and he looks at me with this terrified look, and he pulls back his fist like he's going to punch me out. And... I kind of backed up, and my friend stood between us, the common friend. He said, what, you know, what the heck is going on? And he was just trembling. He said, I saw Satan in his face. And I thought, oh, my gosh, what kind of buddies has my buddy picked up <laughs> in this other town where he comes from now, where he's living? Um, so that, you know, the first thing that kind of happened. But then uh, later that night, we're sitting in the car. We went back to my home, seeing the front yard. The backyard was on the water. We lived on one of the... Um, the tidal rivers, as they're called, that run between the islands there on the Georgia coast, with a dock, and it was would have been somewhere between six and, and ten feet. I'm only five six, and um, we're talking. We're all sitting on the front seat. This is in the old days where you had the bench seats instead of the bucket seats. Big car, room for three of us to sit, so they're not having to look back into the back seat for one of us. And as we're talking, all of a sudden, um, began to have. I don't know how to describe it. It felt like a palpable darkness that came onto my head and began to, to press down on me so that my uh, my knees slowly went forward until they hit the dashboard. And then when my body couldn't go any further, it felt like it was coming into me. And um, you know, this isn't sure what it all to make of that, but uh felt as if inside of me there was one little part that was still me. The rest of it was darkness, this darkness. And um, then all of a sudden, uh, I hear a voice in my head that says, I'm going to throw you in the water. And um, immediately, I knew what that meant because I couldn't swim. And then it was going to drown me. Um, so, uh, you know, I panicked. But then all of a sudden, this huge strength. I'm not a, not a very strong person. I'm a small person, at least tall, not side to side. And... Uh, surged through me in both my arms and I began to try to, I was in the middle, try to climb over the guy on the passenger side to get out the door to go down to the water. It's like it was compelling me to do that. And they didn't know what was going on, but they knew something was crazy. So they both held on to me. They were both big football players. Each grabbed an arm and a shoulder and held me down. And I came very close to, you know, overcoming both of them and getting out. And then a second voice came into my head and said, Focus on the cross. Focus on the cross. And um, I don't know what to think of that, but the little part of me that was still in there started, you know, the mind started racing, cross, cross, how can I focus on the cross? And I remember that I was wearing a, a, a silver cross, it was a Celtic cross, on a chain around my neck that my girlfriend had given me. And uh, she was Catholic at the time, probably agnostic as well, as I recall. Um I was able to kind of extricate one of my hands, grab the thing, and all I needed to do was to, to obey that command. Literally, I stuck it up to my face, started looking at it and focusing physically on the silver cross. And then uh, as I did, things began to subside. So uh, my friends asked me, you know, what the heck is going on? And uh, I described it for them. Uh, the guy that I didn't know so well who was now visiting um, said, that's interesting. My girlfriend had an experience just like that. So was just kind of, you know, really spooked. And I said, okay, you, you guys can go home. I'm, I'm going to the house now. Of course, I didn't sleep all night just thinking about it. Um, the next morning, I uh, told my experience to my um, my senior English teacher, also my homeroom teacher, who was my closest adult friend. And uh, she was a very vibrant Pentecostal Christian. And as soon as I told her, she said, you've been playing around the occult stuff. Leave that alone. <laughs> you know, it's that you've had an encounter with the devil. And I you know, looked her in the eye very politely, she's my friend, and said, don't be so medieval. Things That kind of thing doesn't exist. It's not real. And she said, it does, and you better, you know, you better stop playing around with that stuff. So I was thinking about it all day. That afternoon after school, I get home, and I, I call up uh, my buddy and say, put put the other guys on the phone. You know, so he gets on the phone. I don't want to use names, but um, said, you said your girlfriend was had this experience like I did, right? He said, yeah. And I said, well, does she go to church? Is she religious at all? And he said, yeah, she does. And I said, well, what church does she go to? 
and she she said she goes to the Church of Satan. She's a, a witch, <laughs> and I nearly dropped the phone. Yeah, I thought, oh my gosh, uh, witches! This, this, this is the twentieth century. At the time, it was the twentieth century. The twentieth century witches, devils. Come on, I can't believe this. But okay, thanks. Put it down. Began to think about it, and uh, I did know that you know the strength that was compelling me was that I really was overcoming the other two guys. That was kind of an objective evidence that it wasn't just something going on in my mind. Um, and then that evening, I, I recalled from my Bible study as a kid, I was raised Presbyterian, uh, that there was at least one occasion in the gospel where a demon had possessed a man, and he told Jesus that the demon tries to throw the boy, he was in a boy, or, I'm sorry, the demon possessed a boy, and the father of the boy said that the demon tries to throw him in the water or into the fire, presumably to kill him. And that began thinking about that. What if, this is really weird, what if that stuff is true um, that I rejected those years ago? Um, this thing was does not fit into my, my, my current worldview. My current worldview is really tidy, but it's not sitting then. And I began to, that's something to go back to the scriptures to begin reading about them, finding about other people that had similar experiences. And, you know, I know folks can look at that and say, um, well, maybe it was just in your own mind, or maybe just the adrenaline made you stronger than your friends, or that kind of thing. But um, I did. It took a few months to become a Christian. A few months after that, I had some amazing experiences in what I call like experimental prayer. I would, uh, you know, get into a situation where I thought something was really needed that God could do, but I didn't know if I believed in Him yet or not. So I'd ask Him, and then He would answer in a dramatic way. And uh, so a few months later, I did come to faith. And then after I became a Christian, I had a number of experiences that just confirmed all of that. During the period when I was kind of re reawakening, you might say, when I was still in high school there, or is that the period you mean? Yeah, so I had, okay, let me give you an example. It, yeah, it, was it was it, was it it around that time? or? Yeah, so this was the uh, fall of my senior year of high school. That would have been 1971, uh, that fall. And um, so here, here's an example. It doesn't necessarily involve demonic stuff unless demons were inspiring people to act the way they were, but um, kind of experiment in prayer. I'm walking with a Christian friend. We are, uh, we had had some terrible racial writing in the school. In fact, all the high schools in Savannah, Georgia, that's where I lived at that time, had had it. was a long story behind while that was going on. And I'd been in the middle of a riot <clears throat> before and saw my black and white friends, everybody just trying to kill each other. Uh would have been maybe a month after that, some weeks after that. She and I walked around, go to a part of the campus in between wings. We didn't have uh, multiple stores then. And we saw that a mob had was gathering. And um, there were two sides. One was all black and one was all white. Big space in between them. They were looking at each other, cursing, screaming, fist clenched, knives, tar tools. Uh, we didn't have metal detectors in the schools back then. And I'd seen this happen before. I thought, oh my gosh, they're gonna, there's going to be a riot again. And we're off some distance, my friend and I. And they're not looking at us. They're looking at each other. And she turns to me and says, I don't know about you, but I'm going to pray. She drops to her knees and prays. And so here I am. I have a dilemma. You know, at that point, I still don't believe in God. But if there's any chance that there is a God and that he could help my friends so they don't kill each other, I, I felt like I had to humble myself and, and do something. So Again, they're not even looking at us, so what we did would not have had any natural impact on them. I knelt beside her, and, and I said, you know, God, if there is a God, it still chokes me up. If there is a God, this can't possibly be your will. Do something. Just do something. Finished praying. We stood up. It was only, I mean, it was less than a minute. It was a matter of, of seconds, really, when all of a sudden somebody on one side began to laugh just in the midst of all this obscenity, screaming, and horrible things and all that, somebody begins to laugh. And it wasn't just a giggle. It was like a belly laugh. And then the people around him started laughing. And then it jumped across the gap to the other side, and they began laughing. And as I watched, in the end, everybody was laughing, and all the anger drained out of them. They kind of went like this, and they walked away. You know, then I... <laughs> And I did have a dilemma. I mean, I could I could try to claim that this was all some kind of coincidence, but I, you know, thought later when I was writing fiction, uh, this is the kind of scene that if I tried to put it in a novel, the editor would say, "You can't do that. It's not believable." Um, but I, uh, you know, if 
they weren't SWAT teams at the time, but if they're, you know, a SWAT team had gone right at the time and kept them, it would have been an answer to my prayer, but I could still find some way to explain it. But this just didn't make any sense at all. How do you, you know, yeah. how do you explain that? <laughs> when it comes to stories like this, yeah, it's not just <laughs> the thing that happened, but it's also the timing, I think. is mm -hmm. it, When it comes to this or miracles, usually it's the timing of like the prayer conjoined with the instance of healing or you know, in your case, people completely changing their mood, you know, um, just the, the timing of it is, is a little bit weird. And that's what sort of is more expected if the thing is real, you know, than, mm -hmm. than mm -hmm. if it's not. But I, I did want to ask you, in, in your view, how do we know just beyond your own personal experience, how do we know that demons are real? Like, have you gained any insights from your academic or theological studies that support the existence of demons? I have, and and first I will say, uh, we you know we do need to count first person testimonies as as some kind of evidence. So a lot of folks want to say about things like this only if science can prove it, and we can talk about that in a minute. Um, but I began to encounter a lot of other folks, you know, had similar situations, some of them more uh, wild than mine. Um, I also had other encounters. I went off to Europe as a, a Christian missionary, it was a lead singer at a rock band, and we had a great time, but. Encountered some wild things there hmm. as present for uh, an exorcism in which the person's body, the victim's body was contorting all kinds of wild ways. And then a voice that did not belong to that person began to speak um, and tell the people in the room their secret sins <laughs> that you know, the person could not have had any, any, uh, any knowledge of. I was uh, We were singing in an underground um shopping center in Frankfurt, Germany, where people would go, and a lot of shoppers, but then people would go and do little entertainment gigs and put out hats or boxes, and little people would, would give them money in. We did it. We weren't looking for money, but uh, we stopped. Uh, we just stopped singing, and a friend said, come over to this other part. You've got to see uh, the um, this underground place. you got to see what's going on. I go. There's a big crowd gathered, and there's uh, in front a uh, Man, probably in his 30s, little boy, probably elementary age. Uh, the man is dressed in what might loosely be described as uh, Indian garb, not Native American, but India. This is, uh, you know, some from India and looks like he, he might be of that ethnicity. And the little boy, too. And while we were standing there watching, uh, he went into a trance. His head went back. His eyes turned back. And he began to, uh, the little boy would hand him needles, but they were like big rug needles, you know, really big, thick kind. And he began to put it through his skin in different places, no no sense of pain. And um, so I was back in the crowd, not where he could have seen me, if he could have even seen anything. And and similar thing, I just, you know, bowed my head and said, God, if this is this cannot be of you, please do something to stop it. And as soon as I did, the very next needle that the boy handed him, uh, he put into the flesh of his palm and started to press it. And it wouldn't go in, it wouldn't go in, it wouldn't go in. And while I was standing there watching, he pressed and the needle bent against his bare flesh, but it would not go in. But all of a sudden, he begins to tremble and shake. The little boy gets scared. They gather everything and run. Um, and there are other situations I you know, could talk about that had confirmed that I, many years later, um, was in a, I may have mentioned this in an earlier broadcast, uh, was in a room that we had reason to believe had been infested by demons. And as I lie down in bed, hadn't even begun to go to sleep or anything, um, temperature drops, cold wind blowing through and all of a sudden the bed levitates and begins to oscillate back and forth for a minute and didn't stop until I said in the name of Jesus Christ son of the living God leave me alone I'm going to sleep <laughs> but for the other thing yeah there's in my academic research sure one of the, for me one of the most telling things uh, besides the fact of seeing in so many ways how limited science can be it's a wonderful thing of course but that uh, one of the things that helped me to, to you know to see that was uh, I would teach as a, a theology professor um, a world religion course, so I had to make sure I had a good understanding of world religions. I studied them as an undergrad, but also as a grad student. And things that really struck me was that um, even though world religions seem to disagree on almost everything, is there a god or no god? Certain forms of Buddhism that don't believe in a god, or how many gods, or uh, what salvation means, or all kinds of things, what it means to be human. Seems like if you took all the traditional religions of the world, they all agreed on one thing, and that was the existence of evil spirits. No matter whether you you hmm. you looked at 
primal religions in Africa or Australia or in Europe or in Asia or in the Americas, um, as well as Judaism, Christianity, Hinduism, Buddhism, um, Islam, they all agreed on that. That's really striking, isn't it? Um, they must have, you know, that I began to think, okay, it's probably because they've all experienced it. And um, so that was part of it. I mean, the other part of it was, again, real, beginning to realize the, the limitations of science, that there are all kinds of things. I'm an historical theologian, so history plays a big part of my understanding of of how we do theology and how theological conversations have gone. And uh, mm. I just, you know, began to to see, first of all, that there was all kinds of um First person testimony from people who are of impeccable credentials, full of integrity, you know, wouldn't have been hoaxing us, uh, really in- intelligent people, people who were um, full of faith and from very many da- backgrounds, all testifying to the same kind of thing happening to them. I did you know, write a whole book on that called Saints Who Battle Satan, just one subset of the things. But also to realize that, uh, you know, we wouldn't have history at all if it weren't for. Or we wouldn't have even have a jury. I mean, uh, a court system, justice system, if we didn't recognize the weight of a first-person testimony. That science can only go so far with things that it wants to be able to be replicated, or things that it can put in a test tube, or you know, under certain conditions. But I mean, just for starters, so there's no way that science can prove the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's an historical fact that we know because of first-person testimony. And so more and more, I began to see that this notion that's popular, at least in some parts of our society, especially among atheists, that somehow science has disproven that, um, is, is stating much too much for what science can do. And in the face of so much personal testimony, I, f- I find it, you know, the testimony to outweigh it. I was a part of it. The question I often yeah, ask. Well, Oh, go ahead. I'd like to uh, to ask you, like, as a former atheist who was actually convinced through, like, a diabolical or a paranormal experience, you were convinced of Christianity or something more spiritual as a result. Like, what was it that was, ab- what was it about your atheism that made you sort of laugh at or look on, you know, the the paranormal as something that was just completely laughable? Like, why why do people, not it's not just atheists, but why do people have that sort of attitude toward the demonic it's a form of cultural indoctrination you know uh, beginning with the enlightenment uh, folks who were very arrogantly assumed that um, everything of faith was somehow superstition and that they were going to enlighten themselves and the rest of the world and Voltaire the you know philosopher I read as a 12 year old was one of those um, began to subject all that to to a great deal of unwarranted skepticism sure enough there have been plenty of superstition to go around but um, it it began to influence you know Western culture very deeply. It um, uh, and with the growth of science, the uh, development of science, and science was able to understand so many new things. I kind of think I'm not putting science down. Um, people began to have develop the attitude as a culture of uh, not not science, but what I would call scientism. It has been called scientism, the belief or the assumption that's usually that whatever cannot be understood or explained by science doesn't exist or has to be explained some other way. And I run, I run into that in a number of fields. So, you know, I wouldn't say that I didn't believe in the paranormal. I've been through all that occult stuff. Uh, but I thought that it was just something science hadn't discovered yet. And um, it's, we, we just, I think we really have to take a, a great accumulation of first person testimony very, very seriously especially when it has to do things that you couldn't expect to replicate in a laboratory. One thing I actually wanted to pick up on that you mentioned earlier, you mentioned it in another stream as well, is you were in this room in this bed that you were laying in started to levitate. I just, it's hard for me to even, because I mean, most people that have never experienced anything like this, they'll hear a story like this. It's like from a movie. It's not yeah. like it, uh, there's there's no connection that that I have. You know, I, I've never personally experienced anything like that. Um, it's just un, it, it's it seems incredible. You know, how how would you try to convince someone that that thing actually happened? I mean, you, you're 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 claiming that it happened, but what can you go beyond that, or can you just say like this is this was my experience? 
Well, I think what you know, sometimes we have to kind of turn turn the questions around when someone takes that position. Okay, um, how do you know it's how are, how are you so sure that such things don't happen? We've got tens of thousands of people testifying to it happening. Just because it hasn't happened to you, do, is that really sufficient grounds for you to say it can't happen? It's impossible. Um, I think it's better. Was it? Was it maybe John Stuart Mills? I'm not sure. Uh, philosopher once made a, a comment. I'm paraphrasing, but that. People are much more likely to be uh, accurate in the things they affirm than in the things they deny. I thought that's a profound statement that when people say, no, that doesn't exist, they're much less likely to be accurate than somebody who says, yeah, this exists, in part because of their own experience. If they've experienced it, um, then they're much, you know, they say, well, there it is. If they haven't experienced it, then they often have the, you know, presumptuous attitude that it can't be just because I've never experienced it or certain scientists say it can't. Um, the world is just so much bigger, greater, deeper than that. Um, I mean, there, there were other things, uh, you know, I could say, uh, I mean, first of all, when I did come back, it wasn't just because of that experience. It was because of um, a number of Christian people that I knew who were really living their faith and their love and their their goodness. Um, uh, to borrow a line from, from Thomas Merton, uh, when he was an atheist talking about, he met these people that their every kind of every thought and, and word and deed um, was like an echo from a distant country. And you say, gosh, there's, <laughs> there's something really unusual about what's inside these people and, and how they live. Um, so, so anyway, I end up having to turn the question around. Um, you know, how do you know that there is no God? How do you know that Jesus Christ either didn't exist or wasn't he claimed to be? Um, what are, you're basing your, your claims just as, as well as I am. And you're mostly basing them on, on kind of negations, I guess. Um, when I was, during that time in Europe, at the end, I was backpacking through around the Mediterranean. Met up with a guy, his name was Joe. I haven't seen Joe since then, but um, he was an atheist. You know, I was full of faith at that point. I had been a Christian for a couple of years. And so we started talking about that as a faith. And um, just no matter what I said, you know, he would find some way to say, well, I, you know, I don't believe that or I can't believe that or whatever. And I finally said, well, Joe, um, Tell me what, what would convince you? What what evidence would it take to convince you that God exists? And he thought, he thought for a bit, of, and then he was, I was glad, he was very honest and said, you know, there is no evidence that would convince me. <laughs> so let's think about that. Okay, let's say that you're in a pool of uh, potential jurors for a murder trial, and before the, the trial, of course, they're selecting who's going to be on the jury, and each attorney, you know, for each side gets to ask questions of the people and eliminate the ones that they think should not be on there. What if someone said to you, uh, Joe, okay, this is a murder trial. What evidence would it take to convince you that this man is innocent? And you said, there is no evidence. <laughs> you would have been off the jury right then, you know. Um, you have to think about oh, that. Oh, yeah. yeah you if, been there, if you really don't think anything could convince you, then I'm not sure why we're talking. I'll pray for you, but I'm not sure why we're talking. But um Many times I have talked to folks, and, so, and then they tell me, I say, okay, that's when I'm going to pray for you. And I know so many people who, for some, it was um, more philosophical, which came for me a little later, you know, looking at the, uh, the, the arguments for the existence of God. Uh, for others, it was people who just were so very holy. Uh, for others, it was situations like mine where they, they had these uncanny answers to prayer. Those things continued, the stories I could tell you. Um, so what I, I try to do is to give them give them that personal testimony. So okay, you know I have one friend. That, you know me, okay. I'm not going to lie to you about this. This is not a story I heard. This actually happened. <clears throat> the end of my time in Europe. It was before we had emails, before we had text messages. It was when phone calls across the Atlantic were too expensive for a poor missionary like me to be able to use funk. Uh, I'm planning a backpacking trip. The same one with Joe uh, around the Mediterranean, and I get a letter from my girlfriend. Uh, that I had in high school that I hadn't seen since I went to Europe. And um, she said, you're not going to believe it, but I have, uh, I've become a Christian. And um, I've come to see that what the psalmist says, and I can't remember this all number now, but it's a taste and see that the Lord is good. So I said, that's wonderful. And then she went on to say, and I'm going to be in Europe this weekend. I'm going to be at this particular weekend this summer. I'm going to be in Rome. And I want to meet up with you. We haven't seen each other in so long. We've got so much to talk about. We both had a conversion. 
So I write it back, please, yeah, let me know. You know, I'll be there. Just tell me where you're going to be. And as things turned out, I didn't get response from her by the time I had to leave. I already had everything, all the travel plans in place. I couldn't just call her, even know her phone number at that point. But she you know, she'd been my girlfriend for a long time, but we've been apart. And um, so I just made sure I was in Rome that weekend. And I get there, go to sleep that night, wake up the next morning and pray and say, Lord, I, um, I really would like to see her. And uh, this psalm number and verse pops in my mind. I look it up and it says, taste and see the Lord is good. Lord, are you saying that I'm going to get to see her? And I don't. this doesn't happen all the time, but the words came into my mind very clearly. Yes, do you want it to be an adventure? And I said, you know me, Lord, I love adventures. So, okay. So he said, get up and start walking. So I just got up and left the Pensioni. I didn't have a map. I'd never been to Rome. I didn't know way around. It's millions of people. And I start walking. I have an, an impression to go left. I went left. To go right, I went right. An impression to go straight through an intersection. I did all the time thinking, you're really silly. You know, this is, <laughs> you say this is God talk. But the point I'm making is, finally, I get to an intersection with big banks all along both sides of the road. It's like the Wall Street of Rome, or at least it was in the, this is 40-something years ago. And uh, and so I said, Lord, if you're really talking to me, I've got to cash this cashier's check. People my age and with my means didn't have credit cards back then. Uh, so is there a bank I should go in? And I hear in my mind, Banco di Napoli. So I look around, Bank of Naples, and there it is. Go into it, huge 10 teller lines. If you're really leading me, is there a particular line you want me to get in? I hear third from the end. So I walk down to the end, third from the end, get in line, start to fill out the check. Not three people ahead of me, not two people ahead of me, but the person standing directly in front of me was my girlfriend. So I've told that story, you know, to, to atheist acquaintances before. Now, how about you? It takes me more faith to believe that was totally coincidence than it does to believe that there was a God who was talking to me. Um, you can, you know, you can still write it off if you want, totally coincidence, but at least we're given something to think about. It's not a story from somebody else that actually happened to me. Um what are you going to count as evidence that there's a God? Well, I think what this what this helps to highlight is the fact that bias can go either way. Like, there is a bias. I, I think that's what atheists think about <laughs> Christians, is that they're biased toward believing stuff. They're biased toward credulity. So, uh, but I, I think on the flip side of it, you can be biased toward incredulity. You can be biased in the direction of, I'm not going to believe that no matter what you tell me, kind of like what you were you were pointing out. And I think that, that the point there is is just to be aware of your bias both directions. It's not that mm -hmm. one is, is uh, less in jeopardy than the other. It's just that bias can can happen on, on, on either side. But I did want to sh sort of shift and start to talk about how to deal with the demonic realm, spiritual realm as a Christian. So let's get into this subject by just talking about what are demons theologically. Like theologically from the Christian point of view, right. What are demons? Yeah, the uh, the Christian revelation uh, affirms that, as well as the the, the late um, Judaic uh, revelation from God, affirms that before the creation of the human race, God created uh, another race that was also um, intelligent but not human. So what we would, today we would call a non-human intelligence, and uh, that these particular creatures uh, were were not. Um, don't move through space and time the way we do. They don't have bodies. They're pure spirit, whereas the human being is a, is a joining of, of spirit and body. So they don't have bodies they're like that, and that they were created like all things God creates good, but that um, at some point, the assumption is early or soon after their creation, um, they, they had a kind of a test whether they were going to follow God or turn away, and that uh, a great number of them did decide to turn away from him. And in doing so, of course, cut themselves off from God's goodness and his love and his mercy and justice and all those things and became corroded and, you might say, of their nature. They kept the the gifts that are natural to them, which are far beyond ours in many ways, uh, much greater knowledge, strength, ability to, to make things move, <laughs> that kind of stuff. Um, but that uh, in their the character, you might say, that they became corroded, deep, and deeply darkened because of their turning from God. And that then once God created the human race, um, they, as a way of kind of trying to get back at God, um, decided to go after the, this new race that he loved very deeply. 
and that the serpent of the garden, however you want to interpret all the details of that, but it ultimately it was uh, the demon, Satan, trying to turn us away from God as a, a form of retaliation, you might say, but also because misery loves company, wanted to have human beings in, in his company rather than the company of the good angels who were left good. And uh, and that those angels that fell are, are what we call demons, um, the name Satan, Lucifer, um, names like that are given to the, the, the one who led the rebellion and uh, kind of coordinates things now. So from a theological point of view, you've got uh, their angels, primarily, but they're fallen angels. Um, they had their moment of, of testing and subsequently cannot, uh, cannot repent the way human beings have chances to repent. They've been confirmed, you might say, and they're, they're evil. And, um, and because they can, in the end, overthrow God, um, Satan, you know, as, as the tradition goes, wanted to somehow replace God and was, became proud enough to think he could. Uh, but what they do want to do is uh, kind of get back at God. Just like, uh, you know, if it, you might, uh, if you couldn't get at somebody, some person, a strong man, you might go after his, his children. Um, and so, you know, given all that, then they are present on earth. They are able to uh, interfere in our lives, and they, they do so all the time, daily. We can talk about the ways they do. Um, and that because of that, though, God has given us a way to overcome them in what we call spiritual warfare. And that the um, the main thing that God did was to send His Son Jesus, uh, God Himself in the flesh, uh, to die on our behalf and uh, rise again in power. And through Him and through His Church and through the gifts He's given us, then we have power over that enemy. But the warfare still goes on and will until until Jesus comes back. At the end. So, how important is spiritual war- warfare in the role of a Christian life? Is it, is it something that everyone should be thinking about, even if you're very unlikely to encounter demonic possession or demonic oppression or, or anything like that? Would you, how, how, what is the, the importance of the role of spiritual warfare in the Christian life? That's a great question. It's, um, traditionally, Christians have talked about kind of two major categories of demonic activity. And one is, is the extraordinary activity of, of the demon and his allies. Um, and that would be the kind of thing that Hollywood likes to make so much of, possession, um, mm-hmm. infestation of a room like the one I slept in that night, um, obsession, oppression, there are all these different categories of that kind of really obvious stuff. Um, but for the majority of us, uh, what he, the, we have to deal with what are, what's called the ordinary activity of the devil. And that is um, that he seeks to set up what we would call occasions of sin to trap us into sin. Not, he doesn't force us to, he can't force us to but to uh, mislead us, lead us, draw us into, into sin. And, um, and that, so that basically, I guess the, the one word you could use to, to talk about that kind of demonic activity is temptation. Now, not every temptation comes from the devil, but a lot of it does. And so every Christian faces temptation every day, and uh, the enemy is almost certainly behind at least some of it. So that's why it is important to every every Christian. So I wrote a book called uh, Manual for Spiritual Warfare for that reason for everyday Christians to to use because um, the, the the battle strategy typically today of the enemy, as some would call, is um, is either to get people not to believe that or to disbelieve that he exists. It's a stealth strategy, or if they do, to think I have nothing to do with him. When actually, he and his allies are, are right there all the time, and because they don't have bodies. Um, they can actually put thoughts directly into our head. Whether they can read our thoughts or not, that's been a, a debate for a long time. I tend to think not. But um, most of the time when we know a thought comes from outside of us, it's because it has come through our senses in some way. So it comes through something we see or something we hear, or something we read, those kinds of things through our senses, and we recognize it's external. But if a thought can come to you directly from one of these, these uh, demons, the assumption might easily be it's my own thought or even it's God speaking. And that gives them a, a great superiority over us if we don't recognize that. So for the everyday Christian, I would say the, the big strategy for our spiritual warfare has to be to learn to recognize the thoughts that will come from him so that we can disown them and resist them. 
and the battle of temptations every day. I did actually want to plug this uh, this book that you've got. It's it's one of the coolest little like beautiful little books that I own now. Uh, it, it almost looks like a, a mini Bible, but ma- manual for spiritual warfare. It's got a lot of great information in it. And uh, so I definitely recommend that uh, if you guys are interested to go pick that up, I've got it linked in the description. Um, now I, I did want to ask you like if a better understanding of the reality of demons, how can that actually impact one's faith and relationship with God? Could that like affect? Yeah. Could, could that make your relationship with God better in any way? Could it make it more challenging? What are your thoughts? Sure. It can make it more challenging. Uh, if we get, if we stumble over the question of that we've heard so many times, if God is a good God and all powerful, why is there, you know, evil in the world? Why does he allow and, this stuff? Um, and this particular situation, then the, the more specific question is, why did he just defeat the devil altogether and we don't have to deal with him now? And, you know, the answer is is, is the same, uh, at least partly the same. He has his reasons we probably don't even know about, but at least one reason is that that he allows evil is that he can always bring a, a greater good out of it. And I know that can be cold comfort for someone who's just been through a terrible time, but it's still a reality. Um, the greatest example being uh, the crucifixion of the Son of God, you know, perfectly innocent man, brutally, you know, horribly uh, killed, excruciating pain over all that time. And yet it's, we call it Good Friday to, when we remember it because it was the best thing that ever happened to the human race, that God brought the greater good of salvation out of that. And in smaller ways, you know, it's the way it is in our life. And uh, I think it was St. Augustine who once said that as an artist, God makes use even of the devil. And, uh, and he goes on to talk about in paintings, you have to have light and dark colors that contrast in order to make mm-hmm. an image. And uh, for God's masterpiece, then that's part of the masterpiece. And it's a, <clears throat> it's a difficult thing uh, for us. But in one way, uh, the, the darkness makes the light you know, brighter and, and clearer to us. But also, you have to understand the role of temptation itself. Uh, the word, the Greek word for it means trial or test. And uh, when we're tempted, um, what's happening is we're, we're facing a situation where we can say yes to God or no to God in, in some way or another by what we're tempted to. And every time we say yes, it makes us stronger, mm-hmm. puts more spine in our backbone, makes our will stronger, makes us more holy, prepares us a little bit more to live with him in heaven. So that's a good thing. If if we can make the you know the right choice, temptation has its role, and so uh, the demons stay around. That's, I think that's probably their their primary role, is um, is so that we can have opportunities to say yes to God. So, what is the best way to combat spiritual darkness? And you can feel free to to you know pull information from your book. Yeah, thanks. It's uh, yeah, the book I call it Manual for Spiritual Warfare, and I tried to arrange it something like a, a a manual for you know for for war for battle. And so I've arranged it um, in using military terms, and some people don't like that, but it really is a battle. It makes all the battles on earth look mild compared to the, the battle that went on in heaven and now it's going on in the spiritual realm. But I always like to say that the we've already talked about really the first thing, that uh, know your enemy. You know, that's that's an old rule of warfare, too. Uh, how are you going to fight an enemy you don't know, you don't recognize, you don't identify? How are you going to fight an enemy if you don't believe he exists? Uh, or you don't recognize when he's doing something, uh, putting a thought in your mm-hmm. mind or presenting you with a situation. Um, and so that is, that's the first thing, is know your enemy. Know what he is, know what his limits are. And, and we haven't talked about his limits. Um, though though demons as fallen angels certainly have capabilities beyond our own, um, they are not gods. You know, They are not, the, the devil is not a, a co-equal god of evil that's, that's co-equal to the good god. That's, that's the old Manichaean heresy, one of them, uh, that he is himself, a, as we mentioned, a, a creature of God that fell. He's very powerful, but not as powerful as God. God is still his His creator and his judge. And um, and so we have to remember John John's words in his letter, uh, greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. So the Holy Spirit, God himself, is within us. The one who's in the world is, is the enemy, Satan, and the one who's in us is greater than that. So that's the first thing. You have to recognize that. Then the second thing is we have to uh, become familiar with the strategies, his battle strategies. I've already mentioned some about that, that temptation is really, if you're just staying within the ordinary realm of his activity, is, uh, is the main way to describe it. Um, I think it's useful to think about certain kinds of um, thoughts that come to us that are typically from him. 
They could originate from ourselves, but even or, or from some other source. But even if they do, the enemy will be quick to, to jump on them. So, for instance, um, the I think the the first thing we have to recognize is that Jesus called him the liar, a liar and the father of lies. Deception has always been his his primary uh, approach. You see that if you want to know about spiritual warfare from Scripture, I'd say read read the study of the temptation and fall of Adam and Eve in the garden. Read the story of the book of Job, the whole book of Job, that story, and then read the account of Jesus' temptation in the wilderness by the devil. Those three accounts will tell you almost everything you need to know if you you know look deeply into them. But in those accounts, especially the garden account, um, you'll see the enemy uh, trying to to deceive, tries to deceive. Um, he even to thinking that God um, is is her rival and wants to keep her down. Um, oh, he knows. First of all, he, he makes her think that God's a liar. God, you won't die. You know, God just said, she said, God said that we would die. You won't die. Mm. Impression, God's a liar. Um, but instead, God knows you'll you'll be like him. Good and evil. And so uh, that's that's the beginning of how he gets her is through deception. and uh, And also deception about who she is. She's a beloved daughter of God, and he's trying to convince her that that she's actually God's rival. And um, same thing in the the temptation of the wilderness. Um, when the enemy comes to Jesus, uh, he doesn't say, "Since you are the Son of God, turn these stones into bread." He says, "If, <laughs> if, if yeah. you're the Son of God, turn these stones into bread." Right there, he's insinuating, trying to insinuate into our Lord's mind, "You're not really the Son of God." So deception. Uh, uh, another of them would be doubt, especially doubt about uh, who God is in his character and doubt about who we are and doubt about his will for our lives. Um, and another would be uh, what I would call provocation, where he puts us in a situation and gives us, but towards our minds, to kind of provoke us to one of the, the great sins of you know, anger or lust or rage or you know, things like that. Um, another is uh, accusation. He's calling the scripture the accuser of the brethren. And um, so often he will try to bully us by saying things about us. Sometimes that might be true, but um, but the impression he gives us, he's pressing a lot, of, is that because these, these things about us are true or they're bad, then we're lost. You know, despair pushes people toward despair the way he did to Job, for instance, trying to make him despair. But he may also accuse us about the people around us. You know, hey, he might say to uh, you know, your, your wife doesn't really pay much attention to you, but your secretary was, why well, does, why don't you ask her out to dinner? You know, that kind of making an accusation against his wife. Um, so uh, th- those are some of the examples. i you know, give some more in the scripture of the kinds, the categories of thoughts, uh, his strategies of how he comes to us. So we have to know who he is, know our enemy, know his strategies and his capabilities. Um, and we need to know uh, who our comrades are. And our comrades are, first of all, other Christians. St. Paul talks about that, how we, um, the Christians fight in the battle, and we have to, to watch out for each other through prayer, things like that. But also um, the, the angels. I, I like to say God has kind of a, a three-division three army. One is the, what is traditionally called the church militant, Christians on earth who are still fighting the battle. Um, then the, the, the angels who are fighting for us, God says them to help, and then the saints. Those are the ones we, in tradition, we, we call it the, the church triumphant. They've already won their battle on earth. They're in heaven with God. And he, they pray for us. They, they, he sends them out on missions for us. So you've got this great army um, that, that we're a part of. So that's important to, to recognize who are, and that Jesus is our commander, and we've got all these comrades. Then you got to get into the weapons. You know, the um, weapons will be obvious things, Prayer, of course, indispensable. Uh, fasting to sharpen that prayer. When Jesus knew he was um, going out into the wilderness to engage the enemy, uh, what did he do to prepare for the battle? He fasted and prayed. And uh, so that's one really important thing. The enemy starts to put thoughts in our mind. We bring God into the conversation. Um, but then also scripture, so important. You know, Christians know this as a, as a basic thing, but it's good to be reminded in this regard how important it is. Jesus may have prepared for his encounter in the wilderness with the devil by his prayer and fasting, but when he actually engaged the enemy, what was he using? He used the scripture. And uh, the enemy could quote scripture, of course, too, so Jesus had to know the, the real meaning of it. But again and again, the enemy would 
would, um, you know, come out of uh, with a thought or, or temptation, and Jesus would parry him with Scripture. So that's important for us too. If, if Jesus, you know, did that in battle, then then we should too. We've got uh, other things as well. You know, from the Catholic tradition, the sacraments. Um, baptism has brought us out of the, the realm of darkness into the uh, the kingdom of light, and um, it's, it's a great help, you know, protection for us. Um, for, for us, the sacrament of confession, the sacrament of uh, the Eucharist, all these, each one I go in my book, uh, have a particular role to play in spiritual warfare. Uh, we have also what we call sacramentals, and those aren't sacraments, but they are um, either blessings or uh, objects that have been blessed that uh, become kind of occasions for grace, for spiritual power. Um, takes a little time to kind of explain them, but things like, you know, people will be familiar with, like holy water, um, blessed metals, um, the rite of exorcism in the Catholic tradition is itself a sacramental. Uh, making the sign of the cross is a sacramental. Hmm. I know some folks, you know, will probably say, okay, that sounds more like magical thinking. And the, the Catholic teaching about it is just that um, that when something is a blessing or has been blessed, that it is being joined to the prayers of the whole church. And that those prayers are very powerful. Uh, uh, scripture tells us the prayers of a, um, of a righteous man are effective. And, and so if you've got all these righteous people in the Church of the Ages whose prayers are being joined, then, then there's power available to you. Not magic, but it's the power of God. And I would just offer a couple of... I've been involved as a consultant on a number of um, cases that most of which turned out to be needing exorcism of some kind. And um, so I've talked to exorcists, and interesting what you find. You know, So for instance, um, I think maybe you may have mentioned out, outside our talk now, that uh, we have to be careful that we're not just dealing with a mental illness or even a physical illness. And at least in the Catholic tradition, there's a very strong presumption that something is medical or psychological rather than spiritual until you have evidence otherwise. So if you go to a priest and you say, I think the demon's coming after me or I think the demon's you know, in, in me or whatever, the first thing that he's instructed to do by the church is get you medical, help you find medical care, psychological care. And, uh, and if all that kind of gets ruled out, then they begin to look at could there be spiritual things. And uh, I'm connecting this all to sacramentals. So, for instance, holy metal. There, we're in one right now, St. Benedict metal. And it's been blessed, you know, by a priest, and uh, this has a very special blessing for it. And in Catholic thought, there is this power. The prayers of the church are associated with this. Um, that's the whole notion from the old vampire films that, you know, when a, when a vampire comes after you, he's diabolical, you hold up a crucifix and he backs off. But in, in this case, um, one of the tests that some exorcists will have to see if something is just psychological or, and emotional, or if there's actually spiritual, something going on, they'll have the person who, um, you know, is, this, is saying that they're, they're a victim of this, uh, sit at a table, and then they'll bring in, say, a, you know, maybe five or six holy medals. But only one of them has been blessed. And um, and then they'll ask the person, what do you think of those? And if, you know, if they don't think much of anything about it, then probably it's just psychological or medical. But what you do often have when it is a genuine case of spiritual uh, problems, they'll begin to point to different metals and say, that's stupid, that's silly, that's just a piece of metal, that's that. And then they'll go to the one that was blessed and say, get that away from me, it burns, something like that. So that, it's as if the demon inside them is testifying to the reality of these things. Um, you get a similar, similar kind of thing. Uh, well, I won't go into details, but so anyway, in Catholic tradition, those those are very important things, and exorcism itself is one of the the uh, the sacramentals that we have. You know, in our battle, what's the defensive armor? And Saint Paul talks about in, the, in Ephesians. He talks about how you need the helmet of righteousness or a helmet of salvation. Uh, sometimes hope of salvation, he says in another place, the breastplate of righteousness, sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, shield of faith. You got something wrapped around your loins. You got something on your feet. It's great. All these things are like defensive armor. But the interesting thing is that um, that he doesn't mention anything to cover your back. <laughs> and uh, you think about medieval warfare where they got chain mail that covers the back, so the back is somewhat protected. Why would St. Paul have not, not mentioned something to cover the back? And when you look at it, you realize he was using, making an analogy, using uh, 
this the weapons of the Roman imperial soldiers of his day to, to make the analogies. And they didn't have anything to cover their back. Why was that? Because they were taught to fight in such a way that your weapon protected the back of your comrade and he protected yours. And I think that's a great spiritual principle to realize we really need each other. We need their spiritual safety and, and being in good Christian fellowship and praying for each other, pointing out weak spots in our backs that we can't see spiritually. And then uh, finally, I, uh, uh, keep in mind, I think that the the best defense is uh, is our character and that the, the best defensive weapons, if you want, are, are the virtues. And um, we could talk about each virtue and how it protects us, you know, the principle of righteousness, and hope, and faith, all those. But I like to focus on the most important one, um, according to the, the ancient teachers of the church, was humility, that humility is the virtue in which all the other virtues grow. And uh, give you an example from the, the ancient church in the deserts of the uh, of the Middle East, where the, the ancient fathers and mothers of the desert who began the monastic movements used to go out and have their hermitages. And um, there's a story of how there was a young man who was so humble. He was a great example to all the other hermits in his area. And because of that, the enemy had a target on his back. He wanted to get this guy not only to make him trip up, but he would make the others trip up. And so he appeared to him one day. He's praying in his cell, his room. And the devil appears as an angel of light. Scripture tells us he can do that. And he says, I'm paraphrasing, but something like, oh, you mighty man of God, I've been sent to heaven to you. And the man was so humble that he didn't even look up. He just said, that can't possibly be me. Go check the guy in the next in the next room. And you know, the demon had the equivalent of curse that is foiled again, poof, and disappeared. Great story. I mean, it illustrates what I'm talking about, that he had, he had humility wrapped around him. And when the enemy, is, to use St. Paul's language, sent a fiery dart to try to pierce his heart of temptation to make him, uh, encourage him to sin, it fell to the ground useless because he had his defensive armor on. And I think that's true of, of all the virtues. And finally, I will make this short, that we, we need to, as I say, keep, uh, keep the enemy out of our camp. Um, you think about the old story of the Trojan horse, and uh, Satan has his Trojan horses as well, where he'll have something that looks very attractive, and we'll say, oh, I want that, and we bring it into our, the fortress of our soul, and then when we're not looking, bad stuff comes out. And uh, that can be a lot of things, but especially cult practices, as I've discovered, it can be um, certain kinds of very serious sin. Um, it can, can be certain kinds of, of um, you know, cultic religion, certainly Satan worship or that kind of thing, witchcraft. And so those things are presented in our culture often as very good things and tempting things. Don't, you know, don't participate in them. If, otherwise, you're inviting the enemy into your camp. So toward the end of each interview, we give our Patreon supporters a chance to ask questions, thought-provoking questions that they have related to today's topic. So if you'd like to join our Patreon, check the description. The first question is from Max Hall. He says, what's his best advice for trying to convert a close atheist friend when he was an atheist, which approaches by Christians in his life were effective and which approaches were ineffective? Yeah, I think at that particular point, arguments would not have done much for me. <laughs> um, it was the... Uh, among the Christians, that was the one who were, who were living these just sterling lives that stirred me up and said, I, I want that. I'm, I'm hungry for that. Same way it happened with Thomas Burton. It wasn't the only thing that convinced him uh, to become Christian, but it was very powerful. Um, <clears throat> the other is, is just always to, you know, to do what Scripture says, to be ready in season and out of season, to give an account for your faith. That, uh, when the person asked, well, why would you believe that? How could you believe that? To be able to give a reasonable account for that and and like I said, maybe you can turn the question around and say, no, so um, how, how would you explain your, you know, your, your rejection of that? Or, or what do you base that? And, and not do it. Our attitude's so important. Not do it as a kind of battle. We're going to win the battle because if we do, we'll probably lose the soul. Uh, but to do it in, especially you mentioned close friends. But close friends, we just say, yeah, I'm, you know, just like you have trouble understanding why I believe this, I have trouble understanding why I don't. So let's talk about it. All right, our next question is from Paul Rimmer, who's actually a scientist, and he's working on uh, origins of life. Really, really, really interesting guy. We've, we've had him on the show before, uh, but he's also a supporter of the channel. So his question is, if someday you came to dismiss your own experiences of the diabolical, would you remain a Christian? And if so, what is the main reason you're a Christian today? 
great question. And we've only, you know, focused on these seeds because that was the focus of the of the conversation that we wanted. But um <clears throat> yeah, if I came to to believe that those things could be explained some other way, yeah, it would not not affect my Christian faith. It was the things happened in a way that kind of sparked me to move outside, to recognize the limits of the view I had. And of course after that then is when I began to to go more deeply into uh, apologetics by people like C.S. Lewis, who were just thoroughly convinced, uh, convinced me of uh, so much that people like Chica Chesterton eventually and others. So no, I wouldn't lose it. I, uh, I, I can't say that I would lose my belief that such things exist, even if I thought that somehow I, I didn't encounter them myself. That's such a, a fundamental part of the, the Christian faith, as I can understand, certainly in the Catholic tradition, that for me to reject that, I'd be rejecting a whole lot of other things. But yes, yes, I, I certainly would still be um, my after that initial breaking out of the old worldview, I, what I really had to do was was reconstruct my worldview in light of this new reality. When I was reading the Gospels, that this man really was God in the flesh, and he was he claimed to be, and he did these things. Now, what do I do? Um, I think it was maybe Lewis. It could have been Chester who once said that you know it's not that Christianity explains everything tidily in a tidy way. But that once we're convinced of the reality of who Jesus was and this interjection into the into history of God Himself, then we have to figure out how everything else fits with that. It's uh, it's not like everything's going to be in a, in a tidy little uh, all tied up. So that's what began after that. I, I was uh, went off to college for a semester, dropped out, went to to work in Europe with that band. Had a lot of time to read Lewis and others, and then you know since then, of course, Saint Thomas Aquinas, Saint Augustine, especially in so many ways, so that, that my mind became fully converted as I realized that this thing that I had come into, you know, face to face, not just the demonic, but the divine, um, that it really did uh, did make sense and made sense in ways that my old worldview had never made sense. And so now I, I just, you know, I can't imagine um, losing all of that. It's, it's God has proven himself to me in so many ways in my life. And uh, my understanding, especially in the Catholic tradition, um, is so fully, so fully satisfied my mind. I still have questions, of course, but um, that I've never been able to find anything else that satisfies intellectually the way that does as well. Our next question comes from Christian Gadfly. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Did you try to make excuses for your experience and uh, compartmentalize it into your materialist view at first? I think it all just happened so quickly that the experience itself was such a a shocking thing. Um, you know, people often talk about what they call ontological shock. I think it was Paul Tillich, maybe a theologian who first coined that term, where all of a sudden everything got got challenged because of this one thing that kind of s- smashed the mod. The, and so I was so convinced of the reality of the thing I'd encountered and then began having all these other things happen with other people and the experiments in prayer that seemed to be hard to, you know, to the manufacture or random that, um, no, I didn't really have, have that experience of, of trying to make everything fit into my old view. The old view was done. And, uh, and now I just had to reconstruct by God's help a new world that took into account the things that I was encountering in Jesus Christ. Question from DJ Graham. Before your encounter, were you aware of any arguments for God's existence? And if so, why did you not find them convincing? And then his last question is, how has your stance changed on these arguments from natural theology? Well, these are all great questions. Um, I was really too young to have encountered those yet. I had had kind of a Presbyterian uh, upbringing <clears throat> that, you know, it was fine as far as it went, but it, it didn't include those kinds of things. Didn't expect the the young people who, you know, the equivalent of Catholic Confirmation to, to be challenging all that. And... Um, and so I never really encountered all that. All I encountered at that point was was the skepticism of Voltaire and others. And then that began to just kind of, wow, um, overshadow my mind, I guess. And um, so, no, I had not, had not encountered uh, natural theology arguments, that kind of thing. But, of course, one, once I did, that's what I was saying, once I started reading Lewis and, and other folks, and eventually Aquinas, then, you know, it strengthened and—, and uh, and of course, I see all those as important. I, again, like my friend Joe, I think even if I had been able to, in that moment, to give him St. Thomas Aquinas's proofs for the existence of God, he would have either found some you know reason not to believe or would have said, well, that just doesn't matter to me or I don't care. Um, 
not that everybody's that way, but I'm just saying it's, um, I can imagine it's, you know, for some people, it's still at least something to be, to be satisfied in, in the questions they have. But it certainly has confirmed and strengthened me. I wish I had encountered them as a 12-year-old, a 15-year-old, but I'm not sure I could have understood them very well. Well, Paul, I feel like it's, it's, if we were here in person, I would be shaking your hand, probably giving you a hug and say, yeah. thank you so much yeah. for coming on to Capturing Christianity. It's been a, a wonderful time together. So I really it appreciate has. you taking the time. Oh, thank you for the invitation. Thank you to all your viewers who'll be watching. And thank you to the, uh, the patrons who sent those excellent questions. I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed it. And I'll be praying for all of you. God bless you.